Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, boys, for that wonderful song. I want to thank Michael for reading the scripture reading as well. Good morning, church. Are you happy to be here? Yes. Amen. I'm happy to be here too. And I'm happy to be here as well. Let's just bow our heads before we begin. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask that you turn off any distraction. I ask that you remove any demon that may be lurking around and help us focus in your message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Our scripture reading was from Ursus earlier. But verse 25 is a main key text. And we've been looking at the fourth commandment. The last sermon I preached dealt with the Sabbath. And I've been covering the Sabbath most of the summer. And this morning... We're going to see, some of you may be asking, if the Sabbath is so clear in the Bible, where did we go wrong? Where did it go from Saturday to Sunday? And just as a review, the fourth commandment, we've seen that it's not a commandment that tells us when to worship. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. To keep it holy. We, we can worship any day we want. Amen? Amen. We can, worship at, we can worship at home, we can worship here, we can have worship at school, we can worship any day we want, but only one day we are to keep it holy. Only one day we are to keep it holy. We dealt with the Sabbath also in the New Testament, and we searched those scripture verses that might have hinted of Sunday observance, and we see that it does not give that hint at all and we even looked and it might be even in your bulletin inserts if not there are some in the back we looked at quotations from other denominations as far as the Sabbath these are not quotations from the Seventh-day Adventist Church these are quotations from that Baptist Lutheran Catholic Presbyterian other denominations and their leaders that clearly point out and say that Saturday is a holy day the Sabbath day to keep holy so, so it's not just something that I am coming up with, but, but other theologians recognize it as well. We've even seen in the New Testament, especially Paul, where he says, if you break one, you've broken them all. So we can't separate the Sabbath from the rest of the nine commandments. It's all one package. It's the commandments of God. But yet, tomorrow morning, Many sincere Christians are going to get up, get dressed, put their Sunday church clothes on, and go to church. And I've heard the question sometimes ask, how can the majority be worshiping on the wrong day? Whenever I have a Bible study regarding the Sabbath, and it's somebody new coming into the face, how can the majority be wrong? Maybe the minority, maybe you guys are off or wrong. How can most Protestant pastors and, and evangelists be wrong? Well, would you like to know how that happened? Yes. I'm going to share with Thank you, Donna. I'm going to share with you um, anyhow. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Ja Daniel chapter 7, verse 25 says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into their hands for time, times, and half a time. Here we have a prophetic word. Uh, this is prophecy. A prophetic word. This is prophecy right here. And somebody, we can see here, someone shall intend to change the times of God, the laws of God. And in this process, they're going to persecute God's people, the, the saints, in this process. So how do we know which law here in Daniel chapter 7 is talking about? Is it 
God's Ten Commandments law or is it another law? Well, in the same verse, it says that he shall speak pompous words. Shall speak pompous words against the Most High. So this person, this power, the he here is mainly against God. And if it's against God and it wants to change the law, it must be God's law. It must be God's law. Speak against the Most High. And in God's law, there is only one commandment that deals with time. There where it says, shall intend to change times and laws. Times and laws. There is only one commandment and that is the fourth commandment. If you want to join me there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment is the only commandment that deals with time. Six days, days, that's a 24-hour time period. You shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Someone is going to try to change God's law. And notice I said try. Because that's what the verse says here. Shall intend. Do they actually do it? No. Just a little bit of context here. In Daniel chapter 7, if you join me there in verse 1. Daniel has a vision. And in this vision he sees these four beasts. And I'm going to go over them quickly there beginning in, in verse 4. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings which I watched till its wings were plucked out. Then verse 5, talking about the second beast, looked like a bear and it was raised from one side and had three ribs on, on, its, on its mouth. Verse 6, the third beast looked like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird and also four heads. And verse 7 was the fourth beast. After this I saw in the night vision and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had, it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the resident with his feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Don't miss that. How many horns? Ten horns. Ten horns. So then here, in verse 8, it says, I was considering, Daniel says, the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Just pause here. Coming up among them. Who are the them? Coming up among what? Ten the ten horns. Yes. Coming up among the ten horns. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the root and there in this horn were eyes were like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words interesting this little horn speaking pompous words against the most high just how in, se in chapter 7 verse 25 and we see there in in verse in verse 19 19 that Daniel is curious mainly about this little horn his most, his most interest is this little horn. And verse 19 says, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residents with its dew, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and about that other horn which came up, that little one, before which three fell namely the horn which had eyes and mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows so here he's curious to know and the interpretation begins from verse 23 through 25 which was the scripture reading and here the interpretation that these that these beasts we see are kingdoms Verse 17 tells us, Those great beasts which are four, are four kings and arise from the earth. So these are four kingdoms that arose. But Daniel was interested in this fourth kingdom. This fourth kingdom with this little 
horn. You know why he is so interested? Because this little horn or this kingdom has the audacity to want to change God's law. And Daniel is thinking, who on earth wants to change the Ten Commandments of God? Not besides who wants to, who can change God's law? You see, in order to change God's law, where is God's law? Where did Moses get God's law from? God gave Moses the Ten Commandments where? Mount Sinai, right? But where did Mo where did God did God just come up with them at Mount Sinai? No. no, they came originally from the throne of God, from heaven. Do the angels in heaven keep the Ten Commandments? Yes. Absolutely. Remembering that the sanctuary and all of its services are a copy, as we see, if you can read in Hebrews 9, a are a copy of a sanctuary in heaven. So if on earth in the, holy, in the sanctuary you had the holy place and the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant and the commandments in there, in the temple in heaven you have a most holy place with two cherub angels and God is sitting in his throne remembering that Lucifer was one of those cherub angels. So that, those ten commandments are originally in the throne of God. Can you imagine? wanting to change God's commandment, you would have to, number one, get to heaven. And number two, go up to the most holy place where God sits in his throne and then tell God, excuse me, I need to sit there. And once you can pretend to sit in God's throne, then change God's law. Daniel is so impressed and he wants to know just how it says here, I was curious about that little horn because who is wanting to change what God wrote on stone with his finger? How Exodus 31 tells us. Who wants to change what God wants to write in our hearts according to Jeremiah 31? Who wants to change what God said that will last forever according to Isaiah 40 where it says the grass withers but the word of God stands forever. Who is wanting to change what God said is perfect? It's perfect according to Psalms 19 verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. If something is perfect, it doesn't need any change. Amen? So this little horn, who is this little horn? Well, the Bible, thank God that the Bible tells us and gives us characteristics and we don't have to guess and we don't have to assume and go to other sources, but the Bible tells us who this little horn is, and it gives us seven characteristics. I'm going to go by them fairly quickly, but not too quickly. But these seven characteristics, number one, it's a little horn. We, we read that. It came up among the ten horns. It is a different compared to the others. It has a man at its head. It speaks blasphemy. It intends, it intends to change. It thinks it's going to change God's law. And it persecutes the saints of God. And I'm going to tell you first who this, I, this little horn is. Most of you know. And then we're going to see the characteristics fulfilled in Scripture. The only kingdom. And notice, I said kingdom. Because the horns are a kingdom. The ten horns that came out were ten kingdoms, ten tribes that later on became kingdoms. So the only kingdom that fits the descriptions of this little horn is the Roman Catholic state, the Vatican. Now let's be clear about one thing. And I, I always have to say this. God is not against people. He is not against Catholics. He is not against people at all. But any system or kingdom that teaches falsehood. Did Jesus love the Jews? Yes. So much that when he sent his disciples, he says, salvation is for the Jews first and then go out. He loved the Jews. Absolutely. Was he in favor of the religion that the Jews had created? No. Absolutely not. Twice he cleansed the temple 
And many times he discussed on how they were making God look bad and how they were given a false gospel. A false gospel. But yet Jesus loved the Jews with all of his heart. He didn't come to a Jew. He didn't come to Nicodemus or any other Jew and say, you know, you're a Jew. I'm sorry. You're not involved. No. He loved every single one because he died for every single one. Jesus loves every single person on this earth, whether it's Protestant, Catholic, atheist, whatever you want to call yourself, God died for you. But what God is not in favor and God opposes is anyone teaching falsehood. So here, this power, we're going to see. The first characteristic is there in verse 8 of chapter 7. It is a little horn. A little horn. And notice seeing that the horn is a kingdom. The Vatican is the smallest kingdom in Europe. It is, a, it is a kingdom. It is, if you want to call it, a country. They have their own money, their own laws. But it is the smallest as far as... Geographic. Geographic, thank you. It is the smallest one. It came up among after the ten horns. The Bible says that this little horn came up among the ten horns. That means if it came up among the ten horns and the ten horns was where Rome was and where Rome was divided, it had to have to come up somewhere in Europe. This little horn couldn't come up over here in the United States or in Canada. No, no. It had to come up somewhere in Europe. It came up among them. It didn't come up somewhere else. We're going to see in a couple of weeks another nation that came up somewhere else. But right now this little horn came up among Europe. And the Vatican fits that description. It is a different kingdom. According to, to verse 24, a different kingdom. And something was different about this kingdom. And that is that the Vatican is the only kingdom. The only one that is both a civil power and a church. It's both a civil power. But at the same time, it's a church. It's, it's a church. No, no other kingdom. France isn't... A civil power and of the 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 French um, denomination. No, the Vatican is the only one that has those two characteristics. Verse eight says that it has a man at its head, and we know who that is. He will be visiting next month the United States of America. It speaks blasphemy, according to verse twenty-five. And according to three descriptions in the Bible, what blasphemy is, Mark chapter 2, verse 7, blasphemy tells us that anyone who claims to forgive sin is committing blasphemy. And so the, the Bible is clear. That's why they wanted to stone Jesus because he was forgiving sin. And praise God, Jesus can forgive sin because only God can forgive sin and Jesus is the Son of God, is God. And so this... Power. This little horn claims the power to forgive sin. John 10, 33 also tells us that blasphemy is claiming to be God. Claiming to be God on earth. It fits also the same characteristics. 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13, Paul tells us that he was committing blasphemy when he persecuted the saints in the name of God. You know, Paul, who used to be Saul, he persecuted Christians. And 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13, he tells us that, that's, that he was committing blasphemy when he was doing that. And we know that this little power, this little horn, committed blasphemy by persecuting the saints. It's even here in verse 25 where we read that he shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And they are the only church that has persecuted the saints in a dreadful and terrible way. Just, just, even during the years of the Reformation, Christians were still being persecuted and still being killed. You want to read more about that, I invite you to read the first, the first eight chapters of the Great Controversy. 
Another characteristic is that it intends to change times and laws of God. If you turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, this power intends to change the laws of God. And we've been talking about the Sabbath, and we're going to see just how they did that. But more than, more than the Sabbath, I want to show you here, I have with me in my hands a Catholic catechism. The Covenants of, Cas of, of Catholic Doctrine. So this is what they teach and this is what they believe. Uh, page 37. It talks about, it says, The law of God is the will of God binding the liberty of man in conscience. The law of God is summoned up princi principally in the Ten Commandments of God and in the six precepts of the church. Okay, they added a little bit something there. But notice here. These are the Ten Commandments. So follow along with me there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 17. Here in the Catholic Catechism, in their teachings, it says the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have, thou shalt not have a strange God before me. The first commandment says... I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land, out of the house of bondage. You shall not have no other gods before me. Very good. The second commandment here in the catechism, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay, now let me look. Do you have your, your Bibles open there? Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself any carved image. That sounds different. That commandment is completely removed from the catechism for obvious reasons. Commandment number three, remember thou keep holy the Sabbath day. If you have your Bible, that's, that commandment is what number? Four. And notice, they stop in remembering, they stop in re remember thou keep holy the Sabbath. They take out for in six days God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. It points it back to creation. And then it continues on saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. And then commandment number nine here in the catechism says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. But because they took out commandment number two, you're short. So commandment number 10 here in Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, no. Your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not, nor his master, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Basically, the 10th commandment is what? The 10th commandment is what? Thou shall not covet, that's simple. Thou shalt not covet. And yet here, they seem to split it. The ninth commandment says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And the number ten, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. So here we see a perfect example of them intending to change the commandments of God. And the seventh Id identification here is, is it, it is a persecuting power. It is a persecuting power. But besides all of these identification marks of who this little horn is, and now that we know it is the papacy and it is the Roman Catholic Church that intended to change God's law, I want you to see it for yourself from their own mouth. All right, we're ready with the, with the PowerPoint. You see, we're going to look at some quotes here. And... No, we're not, we're not, we're not done yet. <laughs> and one thing that I appreciate about the Vatican, about, the, about our Catholic friends, friends, they should be our friends, is that they are honest. They are honest. Okay. Okay, there it is. Uh, it's okay, let's, let's leave the lights on because I want you to see my face still. 
There it says from priest Brady, it says, It is well to remind the Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and all other Christians, so that's anyone else, anyone else, that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of what? Of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church, and those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. So what are they saying? Listen up, Protestants. Any Protestants. And that includes us too, but we don't, we don't uh, worship on Sunday. But that, and that includes everyone. They're basically saying, we changed it. And if you want to worship on Sunday, that's fine, but you're following one of our commandments. Notice there from the Catholic Universe Bulletin, page 4, August 14, 1942. The Roman Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by the right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. Let's just pause right there. Just pause right there. That, mm, that really gets me. To begin with, they're saying that the Roman Catholic Church changed. Are they being clear and honest? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But notice, they claim to have the divine power, infallible authority given to her by Jesus. Yet Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 says, Don't think that I came to change the law. Don't think that I came to, to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So Jesus even tells us, don't think that I came to change it. So they shouldn't think that they have the power to change it either. Jesus, it continues saying, the Protestant in claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. Bless their souls. This is not our church writing this. This is themselves, 1942. We'll get to something even more current if you think that's too old. Uh, here, Albert Smith, the Chancellor of Baltimore, says, if Protestants would follow the Bible, they would worship God on the Sabbath day in keeping Sunday. They are following a law of the Catholic Church. St. Catherine Catholic Church. Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995. 1995. You remember where you were in 1995? I do. I was graduating high school. And as I was graduating, this is what came out from the Roman Catholic Church. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. Happened when? In the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Was chosen not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. I really appreciate, if there's one thing that I appreciate about our Catholic friends, is that they are honest. Absolutely. While Protestants are fumbling looking for a text for Sunday observance, the Catholics saying, you ain't going to find one. Stop wasting your time. We changed it. And that's it. We feel we have the power and we changed it. They clearly say there is no text. And it, even, even in that paper that was in your bulletin, in, in your bulletin uh, also shares others. But notice the quote continues from our Catholic friends. So this would be the new Sabbath. Well, so they think. People who think that the scripture should be the sole authority. That's me. Anyone else? Think that the, that the Bible should be the sole authority? Well, here the Catholics are telling you what to do. Should log logically become Seventh-day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. Yeah. Amen. They're even doing some kind of soul <laughs> saving for us more evangelistically yes Amen. friends the Roman Catholic Church are the most honest when it comes to the Sabbath and I appreciate that about them but that is how we got from Saturday to Sunday not because 
somebody because Paul or because John wrote about the first day now observance. We already explored that in the New Testament. And the, here they're making the claim themselves. They're not shy about it at all. And, and this, these, are, these are just a few quotes. If you want to see more quotes, go to sabbathtruths.com and you'll find much, much more. Much, much more. sabbathtruths.com So we can try to rewrite God's holy law till we're blue in the face, friends. We can try and try, but God wrote it on stone and He wrote it with His finger. And Jesus says, think not that I came to change the law. So before we start thinking, God says, don't even think about changing it because I came to fulfill it. I came to fulfill it. So some of you may be asking, well, whoa, 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 what about my grandfather or my grandmother or my aunt? They worship on the first day and, and they're already maybe asleep in Jesus. What about them? That's a very good question, and I'm so glad that I serve a loving God. Amen. The Bible says God is love. In Acts 17, verse 30, the Bible says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooks. The time of ignorance. What is ignorant? When you, when you don't know. You, lack of knowledge. Praise the name of Jesus. He doesn't hold you responsible for what you don't know. Amen. 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 That's why James 4, 17 says, To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. To him it is sin. So if you're worried about a friend or a family member that maybe have, has died and they never learned about the Sabbath, friends, if they worship God to the best of their ability, to all the knowledge that they had, that is sufficient for God. And God will judge them on that. God will judge them on that. And I don't doubt that many never knew about the Sabbath will resurrect and go to heaven because God knows that if they did, their hearts would have followed it. How did Jesus know at the cross that the thief was being sincere? When he says, remember me, Lord. How did Jesus know he was being sincere? Because God is the only one that can read the hearts. And if that thief would have come down, Jesus knows he would have followed and become one of his disciples. God knows the heart. Let's not worry about others. Let's worry about ourselves. Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. But friends, for us, I love the power of truth. We know... And we have been looking. And we have been studying the Sabbath for several weeks now. Today I've been trying to share how this change came about. So for us here who are hearing my voice, we know better. Revelation 12, 17, the Bible tells us that the devil is enraged with a group of people who keep the commandments of God. It says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. There will be a group of people, even still in these last days, not there will be, there is a group of people who keep the commandments of God. And that's all of God's commandments. Amen? Amen. All of God's commandments. And this same group of people have a mission, a responsibility. And it's found in chapter 14 known as the proclamation of the three angels' message. And the first message of the first angel is, Fear God and give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and springs of water. Worship Him who made the, what? Heavens, the earth, the sea, and springs of water. Worship Him, a direct quotation from the fourth commandment. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. You shall not work. And then it says, For in six days God created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. We worship God and remember His holy day because He is our creator. And this first angel's message is pointing people, fear God, pointing people back to God, pointing people back 
to his Sabbath, back to his day. And it continues on with the second angel's message and the third angel's message, which we will cover in a couple of weeks as well. But friends, I want to appeal to you, Matthew chapter 15, as our, one of our closing texts. Matthew chapter 15. Verse 8. Jesus says here, this is in red, the people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Some Bibles say the traditions of men. The traditions of men. Who is the authority in your life. It really boils down to that. You see, if we know who changed it, good. But then what? So what? That's just information. What are you going to do with that information? Who is the authority in your life? Who is the authority in your life? Here Jesus says, in vain you worship me because you're just following tradition, traditions, commandments of men. Matthew chapter 7 tells us what happens with those people. Turn with me as my last text this morning. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Jesus is appealing and says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. People may be following traditions of men and still claiming Lord, Lord. But who will enter into the kingdom? But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Is it God's will for us to keep his holy day? Yes. To keep his commandments? Yes. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. There are people in my life, in my family, that, ha that have had to make that choice. My grandfather, my grandfather had to come to the decision to continue following Catholicism or continue or, can, or begin to follow what the Bible says. My mother-in-law had to make that same decision to continue following Catholicism and not just Catholicism but family tradition. And she paid for it dearly because she followed what God said. Up to this date, she may still be paying for it dearly because she broke off from the family tradition. My brother-in-law had to make that same decision. And maybe there are some here who need to make that same decision. God is calling us not to follow what man say or what man rules, but Peter tells us we ought to obey God rather than man. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or some say work iniquity work iniquity so maybe there are some here that would like more information maybe this is the first time you hear about the sabbath or second or third and you you might still be confused one thing i appeal to you is do not take my word for it Open this book and study this book and follow this book. Only God can bring salvation. Amen. Not Pastor Charles, not the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Only God can bring salvation. Only Jesus Christ. So if there is anyone here that would like more information, we're going to sing our closing hymn and we're going to sing it sitting down. 
So I want you to stay sitting down. Oh, except for the, except for the musicians. <laughs> and then you can sit in your instruments. But we're gonna, we're, we're gonna sing sitting it down. And as we sing, hymn number 623, it's got several stanzas. Church, this is what I need you to do. I, want, I need the church to be praying. This isn't the time to get up. It's time to go warm up the food. No, 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 no. There are people right now in the, in the fence who haven't made a decision for God all the way. In you getting up to the kitchen, getting up somewhere else, you're, 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 you're conveying that their decision is not important. Please pray during the song. Sing, pray while people are making decisions. While we are singing the song, if you would like in, more information about the Sabbath, all you have to do is raise your hand. You don't have to come to the front today. Raise your hands. We have deacons who will be quick in just giving you a little card where all I need is just your name and a number. And we can send you information regarding the Sabbath. If you've already studied and you want to give your heart like Ron did this morning in the waters of baptism and you want to be part of that next baptism, raise your hand as well. Raise your hand as well. You want to be part of the Seventh-day Adventist church, of this movement to share the Sabbath truths to everyone. Raise your hand and be part of this church and fill out your name and a good contact number. And the same applies if you would like to transfer your membership to this church. Just raise your hand. And our deacons will be happy to give you a card. Just fill it out. You have enough time because we got several stanzas to sing. And just give it to myself or one of the elders in the back as we greet out. But before we sing, let's have let's just have a word of prayer. Father in heaven. Lord. I ask that you be with every single person here. There are some who need to make the decision of getting off the fence. There are some that want more information and study more of your word. Lord, I ask that as these decisions are being made in people's minds, that your Holy Spirit may convict. And thank you, Lord. Forgive me if I have done anything to offend. But be with your children that are searching for your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.